Today, tis but a flesh wound. The DFA Daily to the 30th of November 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And just before we start, a quick reminder that at 8pm Sydney time tonight, I'll be running my next live show and I'll be joined by Damien Klassen from Nucleus Wealth and also from Walk the World Funds. And we'll be looking at the latest economic and financial news and consider the implications for investors both here and internationally. It's a tricky time at the moment, so this will be a lively show. Mark your diaries and we'll see you tonight where you can ask a question live. Well, as expected, markets reacted more positively on Monday after the Friday Omicron falls. The World Health Organization said that the Omicron coronavirus variant carried a very high risk of infection and multiple countries joined the list of those who had identified cases. And it advised its 194 member nations that any surge in infections could have severe consequences, but said no deaths have been linked to the new variant. In fact, children under the age of two account for more than 10% of total hospital admissions in the Omicron epicenter in South Africa, according to the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. More kids are being admitted than during the early stages of the country entering the current fourth wave of infections although a similar trend occurred during the three waves when Delta was dominant, said Walassa Jasset, public health specialist at the Institute. South African scientists were last week the first to identify the new variant, now known as Omicron, and while symptoms have been described as mild, the exact risk of the new strain is still uncertain. Governments across the globe stepped up travel restrictions in response and the World Health Organization warned that the variant could fuel a fresh surge in infections. The very young children have an immature immune system and they are also not vaccinated, so they are more at risk, said Jasset, who was part of developing and managing South Africa's National Hospital Surveillance System for COVID-19. She said that part of the increased rate of admissions may reflect extra precaution on the part of parents given the new concern about the mutation. A paediatric report due later this week should provide more information. But multiple countries around the world, including Japan and Israel, have closed their borders to foreigners or are bringing in partial travel bans to contain the variant spread. The variant's existence is what sent the major indices into a free fall on Friday, which of course was already a shortened trading session in the US. Airline stocks were in the spotlight over concerns that new travel restrictions would affect their recovery, though the weekend was one of the busiest for business since the beginning of the pandemic. And Joe Biden said on Monday that the US would outline its plans for combating the latest variant, though he advised those Americans who have yet to be vaccinated to get their shots and those others to get their boosters. So the S&P 500 rebounded on Monday, led by tech predominantly, as risk appetite returned, investors bought the dip, taking advantage of the sharp sell-off in tech stocks. But there was also a bit of bad news with Twitter founder and CEO Jack Dorsey saying he would step down from the social media company. The S&P 500 rose 1.3%, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 0.68% and the Nasdaq gained 1.9%. Big tech led the broader market rebound with Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft and Apple all ending the day higher. Apple was up more than 2% after HSBC raised its price target on the stock as supply chain issues that weighed on productions are expected to wane. But Twitter ended more than 1% lower after the social media platform announced that CEO Jack Dorsey would be stepping down. Parag Agrawal, Twitter's chief technology officer, will succeed Dorsey. The stock initially popped on the news. I've decided to leave Twitter because I believe the company is ready to move on from its founders, Dorsey said in a statement. Also helping investor sentiment, vaccine makers signaled they were preparing to adjust their current COVID-19 vaccines against the Omicron variant. Moderna said it could launch a reformulated vaccine to tackle Omicron by early next year, 
and that sent its shares more than 11% higher. Health experts have indicated that it would take two to three weeks to learn more about the transmissibility and severity of the Omicron variant. Consumer discretionary was also among the leading sector gainers on the day, underpinned by the rise in Tesla, as well as a rebound in travel and leisure stocks like Expedia, Marriott International and Royal Caribbean Cruises. Tesla jumped more than 5% as the electric vehicle manufacturer looks set to deviate from its usual strategy of ramping up deliveries in the final quarter of the year in an effort to save cost. Tesla's chief executive Elon Musk told the company's employees not to ramp up deliveries in the third quarter and focus on keeping costs low, CNBC reported. Energy was also in demand as oil prices surged following their worst daily sell-off on Friday on expectations that OPEC and its allies would delay plans to increase production amid worries about the impact on demand from the new Omicron variant. In our view, there is much to suggest that OPEC Plus will not initially step up its oil production any further. This is presumably why oil prices today have gained by 5% or so, Commerce Bank said, ahead of the OPEC Plus meeting on December the 2nd. In other news, Roku added to recent losses down more than 1%, even as the benchmark bucked the recent trend of negative commentary on the company from Wall Street, keeping its buy rating on the stock. Nothing here, in my view, to stop the Fed tapering in December, but we may know more tonight as Powell makes another outing on Capitol Hill. US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell are scheduled to appear this week before lawmakers to discuss their respective agencies' responses to the COVID crisis. First up is the Senate Banking Committee, whose members will no doubt want to weigh in on inflation, jobs and Powell's recent renomination as head of the US Central Bank. In his first public remarks on the Omicron variant of the coronavirus, Powell said it poses risks to both sides of the central bank's mandate to achieve stable prices and maximum employment. The recent rise in COVID-19 cases and the emergence of the Omicron variant pose downside risks to employment and economic activity and increased uncertainty for inflation, Powell said, in prepared testimony released on Monday, a day ahead of his appearance. Greater concerns about the virus could reduce people's willingness to work in person, which would slow progress in the labour market and intensify supply chain disruptions. Most forecasters, including at the Fed, continue to expect that inflation will move down significantly over the next year as supply and demand imbalances abate, Powell said. It is difficult to predict the persistence and effect of supply constraints, but it now appears that factors pushing inflation upward will linger well into next year. Powell in the relatively brief text, didn't discuss specific monetary policy actions or the possibility of changing the pace of the tapering of its asset purchases. That's a key issue that other officials have flagged in recent remarks. For example, in discussing the possibility of speeding up the pace at which they scale back the central bank's monthly asset purchases and which could give them the option to raise interest rates sooner than otherwise next year, if needed, to keep prices in check. I'm very open to accelerating the pace of our slowdown in purchases, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostek, a voter this year on the, on the policy setting Federal Open Market Committee, told Fox News in an interview last Friday. San Francisco for President Mary Daly, who also is a voter this year and has been a dovish voice on policy, told Yahoo Finance earlier last week that she would accept a faster pace of tapering if inflation continued to run too high. Daly's interview was conducted, of course, before the news of the Omicron variant. Now, here in Australia, Australia's economy probably posed its second largest contraction on record as businesses were forced to shutter and states sealed borders to try to contain a raging outbreak of the Delta variant of coronavirus. Bloomberg suggests that gross domestic product will likely fall 2.5% in the June to September quarter from the prior quarter. That would be the biggest fall since a 7% decline in the April to June 2020 quarter, meaning the nation's two worst quarters occurred during the pandemic. 
Australia's central bank has signalled a weak result will only be a setback and remains optimistic that a swift rebound in economic activity is likely, according to TD Securities. On the income and savings side, massive fiscal support to keep households and firms solvent during the lockdown is likely to have boosted incomes. And in addition, with Australians stuck at home and unable to spend on big ticket items like foreign travel, the savings ratio probably jumped again, leaving consumers cashed up to fuel the recovery. Households tend to save much more during periods of low wages growth. In terms of services spending, economists struggle to gain a handle on service demand as monthly retail sales data primarily covers just goods. The GDP report will show just how hard services were hit by restrictions that prevented large parts of the East Coast from eating out, attending sporting and entertainment events or going to hairdressers, nail spas and gyms. While consumers were largely still able to buy goods online, the services economy likely came to a screeching halt. And then there's labour costs. The GDP reports compensation of employees will probably reinforce existing signals in the economy that price pressures remain weak. Still, third quarter business indicators released on Monday showed the drop in the wages bill wasn't as bad as it might have been given the hours work fell 3.1%. The wage weakness was also more narrowly based than during last year's lockdown. 11 of 17 industries posted declines in the July to September period this year, compared with 16 of 17 through April to June 2020. And finally, also today Westpac is once again in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. ASIC has launched multiple legal actions against the bank over what the regulator called widespread compliance failures across multiple Westpac businesses. They've commenced six civil penalty proceedings against the banking giant in the federal court. The conducts alleged in the actions occurred over many years and affected many thousands of consumers, ASIC said. The regulator has made allegations against Westpac's businesses, including its banking, superannuation and wealth management brands, as well as the bank's former general insurance business. ASIC is disappointed to have to yet again commence legal proceedings, on this occasion no fewer than six times against a major bank, said Sarah Court, ASIC Deputy Chair. The conduct and breaches alleged in these proceedings caused widespread consumer harm and ranged across Westpac's everyday banking, financial advice, superannuation and insurance businesses. Court said that a common aspect across the proceedings had been poor systems, poor processes and poor governance, which he said suggested an overall poor compliance culture within Westpac at the time of the alleged infractions. Customers are entitled to have trust and confidence in Westpac being able to deliver what it promises without suffering financial harm, she said. Westpac must urgently improve its systems and culture to ensure these systemic failures do not continue. It's unprecedented for ASIC to file multiple proceedings against the same respondent at the same time, court said. However, these are exceptional circumstances. ASIC had numerous Westpac-related matters under investigation through the course of 2021, and we decided to expedite these matters for consideration by the court at the earliest opportunity. Westpac has admitted the allegations in each of the proceedings and will remediate about $80 million to customers, ASIC said. And ASIC and Westpac will submit to the court that combined penalties of more than $100 million are appropriate. Each matter will be separately considered and determined by the court, ASIC said. So the six matters filed against Westpac relate to, first, fees for no service, where deceased customers, ASIC alleges over a 10-year period, Westpac and related entities charged more than $10 million in advice fees to more than 11,000 deceased customers for financial services that were not provided due to the fact that the customer had died. In general insurance, Westpac allegedly distributed duplicate insurance policies to more than 7,000 customers for the same property at the same time, causing customers to pay for two or more insurance policies when they had no need for additional policies. It was also alleged that Westpac issued policies to and sought payment from 329 customers who had not 
consented to a policy. In terms of insurance in super, Westpac subsidiary BT Funds Management allegedly charged members insurance premiums that included commission payments despite commissions having been banned under the future of financial advice reforms. Some members also paid commissions to their financial advisors through premium payments, even though they had elected to have the financial advisor component removed from their account. BT Funds is remediating more than $12 million to more than 8,000 members who were incorrectly charged. And then we're having an adequate fee disclosure where Westpac licensee BT Financial Advice, Securitor and Magnitude, none of which are still operating, allegedly charged ongoing contribution fees for financial advice without proper disclosures. Some fees were not disclosed to customers at all. At other times, the amount disclosed was less than the amount charged. ASIC estimated that at least 25,000 customers were charged over $7 million in fees that were inadequately disclosed or not disclosed at all. Deregistered company accounts where ASIC alleged that Westpac lacked appropriate processes to manage accounts held in the names of deregistered companies. As a result, the bank allowed approximately 21,000 deregistered company accounts to remain open. Westpac continued to charge fees on these accounts and allowed funds to be withdrawn that should have been remitted to ASIC or the Commonwealth. And then there's debt on sale, where Westpac allegedly sold consumer credit card and flexi loan debt to debt purchases with incorrect interest rates. The rates were higher than Westpac was contractually allowed to charge on at least part of the debts, resulting in more than 16,000 customers being overcharged interest. Westpac and the debt purchases have refunded more than $17 million to affected customers. And ASIC also alleged that in all matters except debt on sale, and insurance in super, the bank failed to ensure that its financial services were provided efficiently, honestly, and fairly. So this goes, of course, to the underlying management structure and processes within the organisation, and it will be interesting to see how the court reacts to this. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultant standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.